Great. And if you still see the icon on the bottom of your screens, start streaming. I don't see anyone in the room yet. <laughs> okay. Um, yep, yeah, we've got a couple of attendees, so I guess it's showtime. Uh, I want to thank uh, those in the audience that were able to join us so far for this Ensuring Inclusive Prosperity panel. It's been uh, quite a wonderful program uh, thus far, uh, being part of this conference. A lot of really inspirational decision makers. Um, you know, this, this theme of, uh, innovating decisive leadership at times of disruption, um, is something that I think all our panelists have been really thinking about and exciting about. So, uh, you know, in this conversation, we're going to be talking about how COVID-19 exacerbates poverty risks in the poorest communities and, and how lower income groups in developed nations seem to be worse off face, uh, worse off facing in uncertain times. And so, um, we've got a wonderful panel lined up for us this morning, uh, um, and I'm going to begin to introduce. Uh, we have Wade Channel, who's a senior economic growth advisor uh, for gender at USAID. Um, he works out of the Office of Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment at the United States Agency of International Development. He's a specialist in business um, what's interesting is he acted, you know, as part of his work, actively promotes women's financial inclusion with an emphasis on secured lending and uh, focusing on the nexus of rule of law, business and gender, and has worked as, uh, has worked well, uh, as well in value chain approach to com combating the business of human trafficking. Um, we also have the privilege of having President Vik Belitska who is the president of the Micronation of Lieberland, um, who's also been kind enough to allow me to refer to him as President Viet. Um, uh, he is uh, the president of the Free Republic of Lieberland, which was which actually he founded uh, uh, the was a libertarian country and was elected as a first president in April 13, 2015. Um, thus far, they have over a half a million people who have registered and applied uh, for citizenship. And prior to uh, um, Lieberland, uh, President V co-founded the Czech Voluntary Association Reformery. So um, thank you for joining us, uh, Mr. President. We also have John Montgomery, who's the founder of Lex Ultima uh, here, in, well, for me here in the United States. Um, uh, John, you know, gradually realized that the traditional corporations lack a comprehensive conscience and uh, is, is detrimental to stockholders, society, and the environment. So we're going to hear a little bit more about that. Um, we also have Andre Navarro, who's the chief executive officer at Millennium Investment Bank uh, in Portugal. Millennium Investment Bank has been operating for more than 25 years, um, has facilities uh, in uh, throughout the world, uh, including Portugal, Angola, Mozambique, Poland, Brazil, and China. Um, and he leads a team of e experienced bank advisors. And uh, finally, uh, 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 but not least, we have um, the treasurer of the great state of Nevada, <laughs> Zach Conine. Uh, he's an American attorney, businessman, and politician. Uh, from the, the, uh, uh, from the U.S. state of Nevada. Um, he's currently the treasurer, was originally from New York, worked his way across the country, and now he's doing great things, uh, in his state. Uh, so without further ado, I want to kind of jump into the panel, um, uh, after a round of introduction. So we're going to give the panel an opportunity to just, uh, both introduce themselves a little bit more than I have already, um, but also a reaction to what the session's purpose is and some um, some connection to their work. So starting with who I see at the top here, Treasurer Conine, why don't you uh, start with your opening comments? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. A uh, pleasure to be back at this conference, although I can say that the uh, locations we're all currently in seem a little less exciting uh, than the location we were all planning to be in in Portugal, uh, but we will come visit you soon. Uh, you know, when our office, I'm the 23rd treasurer of the great state of Nevada, right? And our office looks at um, ensuring inclusive prosperity as really a process of how can we adjust 
government systems, a lot of which have been in place for quite some time, and try and refresh them and make sure that they're taking care of everyone. Now, the pandemic has exacerbated uh, what I think, at least in the United States, have been long-term issues uh, around race and inclusivity, uh, about our ability to provide capital uh, to those among us who don't have kind of, you know, historical uh, legacy wealth. And I'm trying to bridge that gap, not so that everyone can end up in the same place, but so that everyone has a better chance uh, from having a, a similar starting place. And so we found the problems are typically due to three issues. One is old and outdated systems uh, in Nevada, but also in other states in the United States. We have not invested along the way. Uh, we have a a mechanic of paying for things that is effectively just paying attention when something breaks. Uh, and so that doesn't allow us to create long-term resiliency. So one of the things my office has been focused on is how can we fix things before they break so that when problems happen, when pandemics happen, we're not caught flat-footed. Uh, number two is a human capital issue that I'd be curious to hear from the other panelists if they've ever run into this. But specifically with government, sometimes uh, there's a process by which individuals have said, well, we've been doing this thing for so long, there's no possible way we could do it better. This is just the way it is. And so breaking through that calcification and helping to get uh, government employees, a lot of whom aren't incented in the way that private sector employees are, right? And they don't get paid more when they do a great job. Um, now, hopefully the people who choose to join the, pro the public sector are doing it for other reasons, uh, but trying to attract those people in the first place and, and building a talented workforce has always been a challenge. Uh, and I think number three, you know, there's been a lack of willingness historically uh, on the point of the public sector uh, to engage in the kind of public-private partnerships that could be really useful. And a lot of that is distrust and, and somewhat a, uh, a lopsided arrangement from a legal perspective. I'll give a quick example. Sometimes when we arrange public-private partnerships, it's myself and uh, you know, someone from the attorney general's office and somebody from the economic development office. And so we have a lawyer, right? And then the other side will show up with 20 lawyers. And you're immediately in a place where you feel like you're going to miss something. Uh, and so I think there's a little bit of distrust there. So we've been trying to build relationships, not just when it comes to the deal, but build relationships outside of a transaction uh, to try and create long-term value. So we've been working again on ways uh, to make our government uh, more quick, uh, a little bit more efficient, a little bit more effective, very, very focused on outcomes as opposed to necessarily uh, all the different steps along the way, uh, because sometimes all the steps along the way aren't really actually moving us closer to outcome. Um, we've also been looking at ways to make higher education more uh, achievable, one of uh, from a prosperity standpoint, building that sort of generational growth uh, that we'd like our state to be known for, but also our country to be known for, requires educational growth, right? 65% of jobs in Nevada are going to require some sort of post-high school degree uh, this year, right? It's a couple-year-old stat, but basically it was this year. It'd be two-thirds of jobs will require that, but only one-third of our residents have uh, more than a high school diploma. So trying to bridge that gap and also making sure at least in our office, that money isn't the reason why people uh, don't get a thing done. So during the pandemic, we've been revisiting what's important to us. I think uh, everybody on the panel can speak to different ways of how we've uh, perhaps changed in our mind who an essential worker is, right? Paying a lot more attention to the folks that drive our trucks and stock our shelves and keep us safe uh, if we end up in the hospital or, or have to go to a doctor. And so we've been looking at how do we uh, work with the private sector to revisit the ideas on things like minimum wage and health care, uh, retirement savings? How do we make sure that there's a pathway for individuals um, to provide something a little bit better for their kids? Um, so that's where our focus is on. I'm really, really interested in learning uh, a little bit more from the private sector. And, and like always, this conference is a great way to bring forward uh, different ideas uh, from around the country and around the world. You know, we, uh, we're very focused on Nevada right now, obviously, given the pandemic and the rest. But anytime we can learn more, happy to do it. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much, Treasurer. Um, you invoked the private sector and, and, and our corporate partners. And when I worked on the municipal level, a lot, a lot of our engagement work with LMIs, lower and, and lower and moderate income populations, were supported by our, our corporate partners from actually a lot of financial institutions. So, uh, Mr. Navarro, why don't we tee this up and you can say your, your opening comments in response to the, the, the theme. Well, good evening to all. It's a great pleasure to, to be back. I mean, in Portugal, uh, exceptionally in Portugal, but I've, I've done the other, the other conferences, Alvarez is also in, in Cascais, therefore it's always 
you know, you got a little Portuguese flavor on the screen. I mean, I'm jumping up a little bit out of my investment bank role and coming more into my you know, experience of the world because I operate in uh, Europe uh, and I operate also in Africa, Latin America and in China. And therefore, it's, it's a little blending, a little blending of, of places. And therefore, I mean, from my experience, you know, the very important, I mean, I would say the very important thing to do in terms of achieving inclusive prosperity is to focus on the community level. I mean, for me, community level means absolutely everything. In other words, we can only bring prosperity if you have, you know, a very, very strong focus on, on, on the community. And from education to work to leisure to politics, in my opinion, we should focus our resources to address directly in the community level. And to demonstrate this point, if you will, I could go into education, job creation and preservation and also into the political side. In terms of education, my feeling and my experience, and in particular from the experience I have, you know, in, in Africa, in Latin America, it's very important that sh school should be redesigned to make sure that we create an environment that kids can feel part, you know, part of the community, that they can have access and play a very important role in the community. They, we should redesign schools in a way that the fundamental drivers like sports, like art, like humanities, they are properly thought, they are properly emphasized into the education system. Therefore, for me, this is very important. Plus, we should also emphasize, you know, the training the, and the reward of quality professors. I mean, without quality professors, it's very difficult to, to give this education process. This has been my experience in Africa, it's been my experience in, in, in Latin America. In terms of the corporate sides, and, and I'll speak a little bit later in, in terms of PPP because we have a, a very, very large experience on PPP and very successful experience in PPP. But before that, um, I believe today the best way to achieve, if you will, uh, the footprint on the community level is to the corporate side by providing direct tax incentives, by creating, if you will, the, the, the right, uh, the right motives and, and the right support to create, you know, sports facilities, to create uh, uh, education centers, to create medical care, to create, you know, uh, transportation. In other words, making sure that those corporates, they are the channels, they're the channels because they know the people. They know the people. They have the workers, they have the families of the workers, and therefore they are the best sell in our perspective to achieve, you know, community development. And on the third point, on the political side, we've always been discussing a lot decentralized and centralized. I mean, and we've been seeing, you know, as, as soon as you start decentralizing, you know, uh, most of the power and most of the decision power into the community levels, into the, the municipalities, you start achieving better results. You start achieving, you know, a more direct approach, a closer approach to people. You should start creating solutions, you know, and, and, and services which directly respond for the needs of each of the communities. From, from my experience, and, and coming slightly on, on the PPP, I mean, we have a very good experience on PPP. And uh, I noticed that America is still, there's not so, so much trust between the public and private. I mean, we had an incredible experience. It was the only way. In particular, you know, from countries which have, you know, a very, very complex budgetary situation, you know, which, which work step year after year on budget side, you know, you need to bring PVPs in place because companies can access the funds, they can access the structure, they can bring the infrastructure in place, and they can receive long term from the state. Therefore, we've done this in big infrastructure. We've done this on the hospital and healthcare side. We've done this on education. Even on the prison side, you know, we've done a lot of that on PPPs and they've been very successful. Therefore, I highly encourage you to develop that and uh, looking very much forward to discussing more detail, you know, uh, with all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, I really love the, the very unique perspectives, um, yet interconnected from all the panelists. Uh, President V. Uh, from your perspective, helping found this um, uh, uh, the bastion of, of liberty that you that, that you still very much in the formation now. Uh, introductory remarks and response to the, the panel. Yeah, well, our goal was when we started Liberland to really build the freest country on the planet to basically uh, front around the places like Hong Kong like Singapore, like Monaco, uh, become a place with a preferably voluntary taxation system and with, with as little regulation as possible. And, you know, when I look at the, the getting rid of the uh, of poverty theme, which is happening over the last century, uh, we know that capitalism has worked the best, that free markets are the best solution. And uh, sometimes, you know, we fall for this trap that we believe that the politicians are the ones that are able to to save us from from poverty and from and bring in the social cohesion, 
But in the long run, it has never worked. And let me just give you one example. I think it was mentioned here already, the minimum wage. Uh, you know, just one simple question. Why, for example, Switzerland, which has probably the, one of the highest average rage, wages in the world, has never implemented minimum wage? The, the politicians never dared to even discuss it uh, in a, in a, for a long period of time. They just didn't intrude uh, with that. So I just wanted to raise that point. Uh, which is, I think, not discussed in the in the world enough, and also that was again one of the reasons why Liberland was created in the first place. That liberty works; it helps to rise the people out of poverty the fastest possible way. And politicians can do the best if they just let let people live if if they do the laissez faire policy and they don't intrude in that. And uh, what we have done in, in Liberland, and of course that doesn't mean that we are not caring for for poor people or for disabled people, etc. Actually, I just came out of meeting with the disabled the basketball players that, that have the, one of the best teams here in Serbia, and they don't get any support now from, from Serbian government. And I, I'm personally helping them uh, to, to become active part of the, of the international sport arena. Uh, because I, I believe that that makes sense to support such activities, but I'm not doing it from the state budget. I'm doing it out of my own pocket. Even though the taxes are voluntary, I'm still making sure that these things don't, don't intertwine. And, and if we look, for example, into how, how the social system works in Liberland, everybody that pays taxes becomes a, a voter, and everybody who, who basically pays taxes becomes a shareholder of Liberland as well. And uh, people in the future can use these shares uh, basically, if they run into trouble, they can cash in on part of their shares and basically have it as a welfare. But they, that will lower their stake in the in the whole society. It will diminish their reputation, which I think is one of the innovative things that Liberland is also bringing on the table, which is kind of this shareholding structure of our uh, national state. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I will say... Uh, universal health care might play a role in the not needing the minimum wage as much, right? <laughs> <clears throat> well, you know, the, the thing about the minimum wage is that really it works in the short run, but, but at the same time, have you ever thought about how many people actually cannot get the job because of the minimum wage? You, 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 they cannot get lifted out of the uh, poverty because they couldn't get the initial job they simply cannot get hold on the on the on the market, and they are replaced by robots just because some uh, politician decided that the minimum wage will be now fifteen uh, fifteen dollars per hour, and they would work for ten, and they would they would basically be able to make the initial money to to become, for example, entrepreneurs. But now they cannot because the the market would allow them, but the politicians don't allow them to be employed. And and those are the things that are seen and that are not seen. By the way, I really recommend you this book by Frederick Bastiat. He has described all these details that are omitted by today's politicians in great detail, especially his book, The Law, which inspired me for my life mission, is the one that explains what is wrong with politics. And again, it's 250 years ago in France. You must read it. Thank you. Uh, Wade, um, introductory comments, your, your perspective from uh, this conversation. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting, especially in this period of COVID, where we um, we see uh, actually, as Zach said, a multiplier effect of what's already wrong is really worse. Uh, it's it's opening up a lot of issues that that we will see, and we'll get into some of that a little more later. But you know, I'm I'm coming from an, a concept of inclusive prosperity. That's my work. It's it's primarily looking at women's economic empowerment, but it applies to others who have been left out of the game or are. Uh, more than left out, sometimes written out of the game. Um, I'd, I'd like to just suggest two pros propositions on women's economic inequality, uh, as well as as and, and recognizing that that applies more broadly. Uh, but I'd also like to start with a, a very simple proposition, which is we have a problem and we can fix it. It's not a problem it, that was created by something else. It was created by humans and humans can can change that and fix it. Um, a colleague of mine, Linda Scott, who's a scholar of, of some renown, recently put out a book called The Double X Economy, and she concludes along the way in there uh, that the relationship between women's economic inequality and poverty is not just um, correlation. 
that women's economic inequality causes poverty. It's not the only thing. There are other factors there, but it, that inequality actually causes poverty in a couple of ways. But of course, the converse of that, we have seen that women's economic inequality is a driver of growth. And we find around the world, if, if you look historically, where you have the greater equalities, you have the greater growth, the more prosperous nations. And of significant interest now, more prosperous countries. Because it's, it would be easy to say, um, to, to challenge this with saying, well, are you saying you can only be prosperous if you have economic, women's economic equality? And I'm, no, absolutely not. We've never had it. The prosperity we enjoy today, which is substantial in many places, uh, was specifically designed with women not part of the equation overall and often to be kept out of the equation. But with apologies to Robert Frost, I'm, I'd like to note that um, along the way, two roads diverged in a wood and some took the le- road less traveled by. And that has made the difference. What we see is a clear divergence that's happening now. And on the company side, it's fascinating because Wall Street is finding that a greater gender balance and, and even a greater inclusivity, uh, whether that's uh, racial, LGBTI, gender, et cetera, uh, greater inclusivity is leading to substantially better performance, period. It's leading to greater innovation, sustainability, um, return on investment, et cetera. That in many cases, having women on the board, um, well, today there are, there's about nine trillion in, in, in uh, institutional finance that is held by a couple of companies and they will not support the board of directors any longer if there are no women on it. They've been working for a few years to get these boards to put women on it. Basically, why are they doing this? Because they're so nice. Um, I don't think that's one of their primary reputations. Uh, it's profitable. They have seen the numbers and that this makes a better company. You know, it would be lovely if we did things because it was right, because it was just, because it was fair. If we did that, we wouldn't need the legal system we have today. Uh, we don't, you know, we're, we're a complex, uh, a very complex species. We can make a mess of things as well as, as create great beauty. But it's quite interesting to see that, you know, this idea of the poverty or prosperity connection to women's economic empowerment is being very well established statistically. It's not just my theory of what I wish were there. It's one of those what I wish were true. Turns out it actually is true. And I think what's interesting here, going back to the fact that this is true for nations and for companies, government and the private sector, is that we choose to change or not change. And we can do those things from a government side. You know, one starting point is simply enforcing the many lovely laws that provide for equality that are generally unenforced um, throughout the world at different levels. Some places, a friend in Eastern Europe, uh, not Lieberland, I will note that, said to me once, if you read our laws, it's paradise. But I live here. It's not paradise. This was a woman. It's like equality. It's fantastic. No, well, unfortunately, it's not. So some of that, getting rid of some of the outdated laws that were based on outdated thinking that we pretty much no longer have, um, that would be helpful. But most countries would be just fine in terms of these equality issues, or at least far better along than we are now, if those laws would be enforced. On the private sector side, one of the things I love about the ability of the private sector to act is it doesn't take five years to pass a law. In most countries, it takes about five years. A well-governed country doesn't make rapid uh, law legal changes. It takes consensus building and all of that. So, and and just a note, um, although I agree about the importance of the private sector, the best, most prosperous countries in the world, for the most part, are the best governed countries in the world. So there is a connection there. They're not independent of each other. Um, but with the private sector, you don't have to get five years of multiple committees and national here. You can act when you decide that it makes sense to act. And I love that because for, for private sector to respond to this, it's simply a matter of changing policies and changing practices, mostly HR practices, frankly, which is not all that exciting for most of us. But we have institutionalized the system that we have in place, which has discriminated against various groups along the way and not necessarily in one purpose. But we've got a result that's not very satisfying, and we get the satisfaction of actually changing that if we're so inclined. 
I also think business and government can work together very effectively here. Some of that just through conversation as, as businesses recognize things, they bring it together and can bring it to the government and recommend changes where, where government can work with business and say, we see these gaps in business. We could legislate if you like, or we could find another way. I think there's a, a, a very comp, a very actually very useful, very beautiful dance that is quite possible between the private sector and the public sector, as long as you're maintaining enough people in the conversation. When it gets too narrow, we know what happens. But um, just some opening thoughts there on where we are um, and the fact that, again, it comes back to there's bad news. We have a mess. Good news. We can fix it. Government, private sector, NGO, independent community, nation. Let's do it. Thank you, Wade. I, 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 it's it's amazing. I think we've got some good consensus going. So uh, politicians alone are not going to save us. No offense. No offense, uh, Treasurer. <laughs> um, corporations alone are not going to save us. And I think what we're really talking about is working constructively and collaboratively together, um, public and private, um, so that we can keep an eye on uh, improving societal outcomes. And so um, John, you've got a really unique perspective here on, on, on the role of corporations in, in being proactive in that regard. I've heard uh, from data like uh, that women make great CEOs, too, by the way. Right, Wayne? So uh, w- why don't you take it from there and, and give us your opening comments, John? Sure. Well, I, I want to riff on, on what uh, what Wade started out with talking about one of his one of his three points was talking about outdated systems. And in my view, as a a recovering startup company lawyer from Silicon Valley, um, where I represented public and private companies as corporate counsel for 30 years. Um, my view is that the global corporate form is an outdated system. The corporation really hasn't evolved from the days of empire where the corporation was, was an agent of empire for the Kings of Europe, East India company, etc. cetera. Um, so, the, in my view, the corporation is an outdated system. It, it exists to maximize profit for shareholders. That's its raison d'etre. And Wade pointed out that one thing to improve corporate performance is to have diversity on your board and, and in your executive suite and in your company. And that's gender diversity. It's, it's racial diversity. It's religious diversity. It's, you know, you, the more points of view, the more creativity. So there's, there's one key competitive advantage. The other um, thing is there's several other um, upgrades that the corporation can have. One is um, corporation now is a single stakeholder model. The only stakeholder that matters is the shareholder. And there's a move towards multiple stakeholder capitalism where the corporation takes care of all of its stakeholders, including society and the environment. And the economic data shows that a multiple stakeholder model provides a far greater rate of return to investors than a single stakeholder model. Um, In addition, the research from Harvard Business School shows that when a corporation adopts principles of sustainability, such as embedded in the benefit corporation, where the corporation optimizes profit for shareholders and provides a material positive impact on society and the environment, those corporations provide a greater rate of return to investors than the conventional uh, single purpose stake uh, corporation, which is just to maximize profit for shareholders. And finally, businesses that have leaders that lead from the heart have engaged workplaces that have twice the productivity, twice the engagement, and on the money side, half of the employee turnover. So if you if you take a diverse workforce, including the board, a multiple stakeholder model, principles of sustainability and and heart based leadership, you have you've you've effectively upgraded the system. So there's a global trend to upgrade the corporate form so that the corporation is no longer an entity that exists to maximize profit for shareholders, but is optimized to not only create as much value as possible for all of its stakeholders, but to be regenerative for society and the environment as well. 
So this, this trend is reflected in new corporate forms in France. It's l'entreprise à mission. In Italy, it's la societa benefit. In the United States, Canada, and several Latin America countries, it's the benefit corporation. And briefly, these corporations um, have two fundamental changes. One is that the director's fiduciary duties extend to all of the corporation's stakeholders. And these corporations have a public purpose embedded in them where they, they, in addition to optimizing profit for shareholders as usual, they've got to create a material positive impact on society and the environment. And what does that mean in practice? It means that corporations can actually take the SG, SDGs and embed them in their corporate charter. So you can, you can actually have a corporation whose public specific public benefit is to um, alleviate poverty. It's to, it's, it's to uh, fuf- do, do what it takes or what it can to fulfill the first UN SDG, no poverty. So uh, uh, that's a new form of public partner private ship or public private partnership. And to um, Zach's second point, we've run into the same human capital problem. The people that run global capitalism, frankly, like things the way they are. And even when you trot out the four economic benefits, and thank you, Wade, for adding a, a fourth to my three, um, you know, the, the people that are in power really don't want to let go. The, 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 there's tremendous resistance to doing things as they are. This is how it's always been done, as my father would say. This is the real world, John. This is how it's done. And we have the power to change how things are done. And um, I, so I just wanted to alert the panel that there's a, there's a global movement afoot of business as a force for good. I, when I did my pre-interview with John, I said, if he's starting a cult, I want to get on board. <laughs> um, uh, so the first question is, is for everyone in the panel, and we can lead uh, uh, whoever uh, is moved by, by it initially. But from your perspective, what has been exasper- exacerbated by COVID-19 in the poorest communities or populations um, for, from your perspective? And we can talk about it from a developing na- nation's framework or from your locality. I think two quick ones uh, come to mind. One is the eight programs that we put into place went to the same people historically who've always had access to capital. So the the federal government here in the States put out all sorts of uh, different aid programs for small businesses, for large businesses, access to municipal lending facility and other forms of capital uh, and liquidity. And it all went during the first phase specifically to the people who historically have needed it the least. Now, of course, it's a pandemic. Everybody needs some help. Um, but we just saw kind of everything flowing in the same place that it was. And the second piece, I think, is a, is a really interesting kind of now that we're for, past the first stage of the pandemic, I'm working from home. Um, as are a lot of people in our in our government and to the extent that we were able to. But what we found was from an average wage standpoint, the lower someone's annual wage was, the more likely it was that they would have to return to work in person in order to do that job. And so I think that's where we start seeing this kind of K-shaped recovery where people who are able to who have the resources, who frankly have the privilege, like we all do, uh, to be able to be where we need to be and, and be in a place that's safe, are able to keep doing that, right? And my kids are downstairs with a teacher, my other kids next door in our first grade class, and they're all safe and they're comfortable, right? Uh, but there are plenty of families that have two parents who have to work. And so we're seeing uh, that that aid didn't really get there. And that because we haven't solved some of the historic issues, there are parts of Nevada that don't have access to broadband. Right. So there are some communities who literally can't do distance learning at the level it should be done because the pipes aren't there. And so trying to fix those things. uh, And I I think that's where the private sector can really come in because we're going to need help. And it's not going to be the same old people in government. Um, You know, uh, like you said, I don't think politicians are going to be able to solve this one altogether, uh, if at all. Well, definitely Um, not alone. Uh, Others respond to the question. 
Well, I was going to jump in quickly. Two things that we see uh, in the development community worldwide, of course, is the erosion of the middle class. This has a tremendous impact of those who do not have. And, you know, the, but the point of business is to serve human need. But we're seeing a divide there where business is serving itself as uh, the major. Some of the majors are making plenty of money right now, while others are that the world is the middle class is eroding. And there's an estimate of 500 million people going into poverty, many of whom have just barely climbed out. The other was utterly predictable and very unfortunate. We have, had, have seen a horrific spike in gender based violence, domestic violence, assaults on women and children. Um, and it this is. Um, it happens whenever there's stress. The world is stressed. Uh, it tells me something is wrong with this picture, and we've got a lot left to do. Well, if I can just jump in with, with, with two points. The, the first one would be on the difference between you know the United States from what I what I understand and what's happening in Europe in terms of how you would channel the funds. The funds are going through the companies in Europe, which I think is very interesting because we're trying to keep the jobs. In other words, making sure that companies are operational, even if you have people home. Okay, but the money is coming through the companies. This is one first thing. Second thing, which is also very important, national healthcare systems. In other words, mm. this is critical in, in the state that we're living today, in a pandemic like we're living today, making sure that people have access. They don't have to worry. If I have to go to hospital, if, do I have the money to pay the hospital? Okay, the system we have in Europe, I think, is very effective for that. And, and you see what's happening in Italy, you see what's happening in France, you see what's happening in, in Spain. I can, you know, give you the, the what happening in Portugal. In other words, those systems could be a little bit under strain, but step by step, they can take care of everybody. And that's a very important thing. It's a very important difference. I think you know. I think one of the most important things which we which we should discuss that of course the cure and I think everybody that can count to five can see that the cure has been far worse than the the virus itself. You know that the economic downturn that it is a self inflictive downturn. The fact that we have shut down the businesses uh, all around the world uh, will create much more death and much more misery. Than the, than the virus itself could ever create it. And uh, I have fresh numbers from Czech Republic. You know, there is 15 people on the ICU unit, unit despite us being the most, the fastest country now in terms of spreading of the virus. Uh, apparently over the long term, the death rate is falling to zero with coronavirus. It, it was just completely misjust, misjudged from beginning. And, uh, you know, I see, I see that this is a, yet another great example where the best thing that politicians could have done from very beginning would be to do nothing. But, you know, who has got the courage to do nothing? You know, maybe a couple of people in Sweden did, and now they have zero cases, zero death, and the world is fighting with, with the coronavirus pandemic while there is nobody dying in, in Sweden. So I'm just reiterating my initial thought that the best thing that politicians can do to elevate po poverty and other global problems is to don't do uh others want to respond i think uh, i don't want to hear from do we hear from you wade and john on this question you don't have to answer i can move to the next question no i spoke john it's you, your turn sorry uh yeah I, I guess i get to have the last word i mean i think it's it's uh um uh, you know do, do you do you it's Again, it's it's do you care about people or do you care about money? I mean, that's really, you know, you know, I, and I, I respect the libertarian perspective. And I, I you know, I spent 30 years in a, in a libertarian um, environment in, in Silicon Valley. And, uh, uh, you know, free markets are great, but they tend to be amoral. And, um, you know, do you really want to live in a, in a, a global civilization that's amoral, that's populated by amoral states and an amoral Corporations? I don't think so. Why well, am I immoral? I think it's amoral to kill the economy without any good reason and let people suffer the consequences. That's what I call immoral. I, 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 what I think is amoral is by states to enforce some quotas on how many people of that or that kind should it employ. That's, I think that's highly immoral because that is enforcing some of the beliefs or, or some of the, our beliefs that we have to, to other people through force, through state. You will arrest you if you don't do this or that. And I think we are actually at this, at this global crisis uh, where we are really struggling with, with, with the morality, you know, and, and people tend to forget that enforcing something through force by state is actually quite immoral activity. 
So we'll make that your last words, President V. We're, we're actually at our time boundary. Time flies, right? Um, if we can get some closing comments from the folks, I wanted to even if we got to our last question about the role of capitalism, ca capitalism and globalization, and how it could be reshaped to give equal benefits. I think, uh, John, you touched on this a lot. Um, uh, but let's have some closing comments. I'm not sure we're going to necessar necessarily get pushed out of the room, but I want to make sure everyone are, are at least able to get some final. You know, I, I, I got to jet in just a second. It's, it's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you all. Um, I guess my closing comment would be if capitalism is supposed to be about creating more from less, right, and creating benefit, uh, I think it's helpful for us to look at that benefit outside of our own pockets and, and bank accounts and into the bank accounts of people we don't know, uh, because at some point our progeny, our children, our grandchildren, uh, or our grandparents might have needed that sort of help. Uh, and I guess, you know, the the reason why, uh, President V, you started your uh, country and, and other people choose to live in different places and, and fight for different things is because to some extent where we live and where we pay, choose to pay our taxes and the try to kind of society we try to build, that's its own market, right? Uh, and I feel relatively comfortable uh, in the investments we're trying to make in ours. But thank you so much for having me. Well, if I first, uh, please. I'll thank you very much for the opportunity. It was a great pleasure to meet all of you and, and, and to share all these uh, these ideas and experiences. I would emphasize just the the PPP concept. I mean, it's been Portugal was uh, I would say a poor country, an undeveloped country about thirty years ago, and is uh, I would say a state of the art today in terms of education, in terms of healthcare, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of renewable energy, and this is all due to you know, PPP projects, you know, and also the fact that the European Union works in the euro is a very important element, although there's a lot of criticism on the euro, but I think the euro has been a very important element for all of us to access long-term finance that finance all of these projects. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure and looking forward to having you in Portugal, uh, hopefully next year uh, on the next meeting. Thank you. Uh, I definitely will be looking you up if I manage to get out there again, my friend. Uh, well, you know, it was a great pleasure. Again, I hope to be able to make it to Lisbon next year and that the politicians will be a little bit smarter next year and they will let us live again. Uh, but also I hope we will be able to organize something like Horace's meeting next year. So I will make sure you get invitation to come over. We will have a very nice venue. 90 selected people from all around the world will be coming here to discuss the pressing issues of today's world. And it will be on August 30. We already have the date. So please put it into your calendars. Fantastic. And just briefly from me, I'll go back to what I opened with. We have a problem, but we can solve it. Uh, there are changes needed. I like what John is saying, which is essentially a call to the original concept of business, which was to serve human need. You have to be profitable because bankrupt businesses don't serve anyone. But if profitability is not the goal. Profitability is the result of a well-run, appropriately run corporation over time. And I will add a well-regulated, well-regulated not only internally by corporate governance, but externally because humans are very complex people by a well by a state that does not put inappropriate burdens, but absolutely puts appropriate burdens on. And that can best be discovered by working together. John, a couple final words before. Yeah, just um, just to close with with a, a, a little bit of an homage to Milton Friedman, who was a big fan of free markets, as we all know. But he also uh, believed that free markets would be regulated by the government, and that was one guardrail. And the other were were, were the the uh, prevailing um, social morals. And and I would say that what we what we really need, I mean, libertarianism is great and Liberland, you know, all the power to it, but, but we really need to, to evolve to a global citizen, a, a global civilization where the core value is that we really care for each other and we care for our planetary home. And, and really it all flows from that. Right now we have a global civilization that's based, at least in the business world, it's based on how much can we extract out of the market how much can we? How much value can we extract out of society and the environment, and um, you know, without regard to the social and environmental consequences? And so, there, you know, I'd like to close with you know an invitation to create a, a global civilization that 
um, at, at its core value, we, we, we care about each other in our common planetary home. And I would just like to add, I want to, first of all, thank you all for your participation. I think it was a really robust conversation, Treasurer, for your proactive approach to the dilemma, look, trying to get in front of the curve. Um, for um, uh, Andre, for your your vision around PPP, the uh, focus on redevelopment in schools, uh, 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 President Pete, for you know your very fresh perspective from from what's going on, and reminding us on the importance of universal health care. <laughs> uh, uh, Wade, you know the, the work that you're trying to do about you know use, utilizing your target population to to broaden societal outcomes. Um, I, I really think uh, you're onto something there. I'd love to hear more about the results, and we would have heard more if, if we had time. And then, you know, finally, um, John, the way that you're upgrading and uh, the the approach of 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 corporations, I think it's an it's an inspiration. So, thank you all for your time. I hope uh, the few people who were able to join us enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Um, and I look forward to staying in contact. I was a I'm going to do, uh, uh, there's an opportunity to do a photo here thing here. So I'm not sure how that works exactly. It's a huge virtu- uh, group selfie thing here. So I'm going to take a photo and encourage you guys to do the same thing. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'll use that one. I, it looks like a bad DMV photo, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, again, thank you all. This has been really great. You have my information. Love to stay in contact. If you ever find yourself in in the central part of New Jersey or Washington, D.C., please look me up. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everybody. Okay. Ciao. Até a próxima. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>